time ago with uh, Tech Stars and Startup Weekend. I did like a fashion related innovation challenge where we flew all the founders around the world to uh, through Warsaw to Poznan, which was well, a lot. Next of- time you're flying in, let me know. Uh, I'm a great yeah. guide. For sure, for sure, man. Uh, Marcus, uh, where, where are you dialing in from? Uh, I'm dialing in from uh, Berlin, Germany. Lovely, lovely. And uh, of course, a nice, easy stomping ground uh, from Berlin to, to Warsaw is a pretty easy one. And yeah, Megan? that's so far. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going live, guys. All right. Oh, we are live, live. All right. Well, Megan, what about a quick mic check since we're still in? Yeah, I'm at our office in Rhode Island. Amazing. Beautiful up there. Next to, Riz, next to RISD at all or? No. Even though we're live. So Claire, we'll, we'll pass it off to you, everyone. I apologize. We're doing a little bit of green room fun, but that's part of it. So uh, Claire, thanks for having us. It's all part of the fun, getting to know everybody. So thank you all for being here. This is the final panel discussion of the day. We're talking about virtual personalities. Um, Pavan is going to lead the conversation. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting. And I think we're all really going to learn about what the future holds for us and our digital selves. So I'm going to disappear. Um, and Pavan, take it away. Thank you so much. All right. Good deal. I appreciate it, Claire. And, and again, uh, you know, I was uh, privy and, and, you know, you've invited me in previous iterations and I, I appreciate you and I appreciate all the panelists here and especially the folks that are joining in and, and watching us and what feels like, I mean, we're over here on Zoom, but I think we could be in like a starship or anything really um, in the metaverse platform. So it's exciting to feel very grand uh, on this stage and wherever you're watching from. We appreciate your participation in Web3. I think everyone's here in the similar context of, you know, we're building fast, uh, you know, independently at times and collaboratively at other times and the space is moving quickly. There's a lot of um, noise and uh, and also really great innovations to continuously pay attention to. And we're all here just trying to see where this all uh, fits ultimately uh, down the line. And so today's panel, of course, we're gonna be um, talking about specifically virtual personalities, what's the future of social engagement, engagement data in our wallets. So yeah, what does this all look like in, you know, in a perfect world situation? And I'll go ahead and give a brief overview of our panel today. I will uh, go ahead in alphabetical order to be the most judicious as possible. So starting with, with Ali Berger of, uh, is it ETA or ETTA? Is that a, an acronym? What do we got? It is. It stands for Earthlings Taking to Action, but we call ourselves ETA. Lovely. So Ali, uh, the founder and CEO of ETA, a mission-driven technology company transforming the future of fashion through data. Uh, Ali Ali has been uh, fortunate. She's worked in in the past in-house in technology capacities, as well as media, companies like Disney, Tesla, Accenture, NBC Universal and Fox Sports. So some really fun uh, tie-ins between the media background and the technology background, which makes, of course, your role at ETA so uh, suiting. Uh, so going forward, and uh, you know, if I mess up on the alphabetical thing, uh, you know, just you know, go. <laughs> with it. But I'll go with Blake. So Blake uh, Lazensky uh, of Outlier Ventures, and of course, they are affiliated directly with Farfetch. So he's the program director of Farfetch Dream Assembly uh, Case Program, uh, and has a you know, I'd say a unique domain insights into what makes Web three like you know specifically luxury fashion projects successful lo- long term. Um, Blake oversees a variety of uh, key strategic partnerships with Outlier Ventures and uh, the relationships with Farfetch. Uh, so thanks for joining here. And on to uh, Marcus, uh, great to be here. Uh, of course, and Marcus Puehler is a CEO of, now is it NextR? NextR, yes. <laughs> All right. Good deal. I should have probably done this in the green room as well, but here we are live. <laughs> and uh, so next are that they essentially, um, you know, they, they are figuring out the, these like lifelike avatars, right, for an avatar economy, which is, uh, of course, a direct tie into this uh, conversation <laughs> we're having. And so he has a sharp focus on driving success for the business, you know. For, for the business of Nexar with a passion for building and running efficient and successful organizations. And last but surely not least, we have Megan Casper. Um, so Megan is a technology investor, a co-founder and managing partner uh, or director, I should say, at First Light. And First Light is a privately held digital asset, blockchain agnostic and technology investment firm. She's the founding member of RedDAO, uh, which she's the world's first digital fashion focused DAO 
Uh, Y'all, they have almost 4,000 ETH contributed to their DAO. Um, they also tout as having the most valuable fashion NFT, which is uh, the gold, Dolce & Gabbana um, Doge Crown. And that was purchased for 400 plus, 420 ETH. So um, Megan, thank you for joining us as well. Everyone, thank you for joining us. So I'll start with this. Now I gave kind of like that 30,000 foot of uh, who everyone is and, and what they do. You know, in your own words, you know, when you were invited into this conversation specifically with this topic at hand, uh, and again, we could start in that same introduction fashion. So we'll start with Ali, is really just trying to think about what, what is like your POV? Like, what do you feel that Claire and the team over at Digital, um, you know, uh, Fashion Week in New York uh, wanted to like ha like what were was the vision of having you participate in this specific conversation and topic in your opinion? You are I either muted. There was a there was a fire truck outside, so you know we're rolling with it today. Um, great question. Uh, so actually, interestingly enough, I'm sure everybody that that precedes me in this conversation um, will be talking about if we look at the innovation curve very far down the innovation curve and really not at mass adoption yet. Um, a lot of what we're about to talk about, we're going to hear a lot of buzzwords that give me hives. Quite honestly, um, coming from a world where I built technology or AI and ML. Uh, technologies and digital twins across every major industry and business sector for Fortune 500s. We like to say that fashion was the last big data dinosaur um, and is very far behind many other industries technologically. And so um, that was really the big inspiration for me moving into the fashion space. I was on a fashion client that was facing massive gaps in the tech skills that they had to be able to bring anything to life that we're talking about in this conversation um, and really be able to create financial opportunities opportunity that is equivalent to today's physical fashion market. Um, and so for us at ETA, um, our passion is infinite alignment of the physical, or our focus is on infinite alignment of the physical and digital selves. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today are the, the data technologies that can be utilized to align our physical and digital selves and how that allows for a more seamless and easy consumer experience uh, and personalized experience designed specifically for your body shopping omni-reality versus just in one plane or with one brand, for example. Um, so I'm super excited to dive into that topic today. And of course, that touches on privacy and security and uh, per, uh, the spectrum of identity um, and virtual reality. So we can talk. I'm excited to dive in soon. Well, what's interesting here is that when you talk about tech dinosaurs, I, I don't know if Blake will agree with you when it comes to fashion companies, but, uh, you know, coming in from Outlier Ventures, Blake, what, what about yourself? Uh, what is your tie-in uh, specifically as your point of view exists with this topic? So <clears throat> I would never call them dinosaurs, right? Um, <laughs> I would say they're institutions in many ways. Um, and of course, they have the value of their IP to preserve, and that's the biggest asset they have, and they should cherish it. Um I think on the topic of the conversation, uh, the Digital Fashion Week is about celebrating the, the self-expression. And with the advancement of digital fashion, we reached the next forefront of where human self-expression lies. And that's how we express our virtual personality. And there is, of course, a whole stack of technology that goes with it, that supports that process of us essentially creating a new representation, somehow reinventing ourselves through new communication channels and the technology that allows fashion to thrive in that domain and allows us to maybe reinvent ourselves in the metaverse is the, the, the key focus um, of what we look for in the Farfetch Dream Assembly based on Battle Player Ventures. Of course, and with that innovation comes a whole new product assortment, a whole new category of product, right? Um, and uh, just to double down on the, the fact that these, you know, let's say institutions that ride on really amazing brand and IP can't can't not talk about or mention Meta Birkin, right? And the, and the case there and how important it was for uh, for fashion and our our industry collectively to um, you know start adopting if they were on the sidelines and feel a little bit more comfortable that there are protections uh, you know and precedent that that uh, gives some guardrails to you know the IP you know what has been so important. I find um, it somewhat and, ironic. Sorry, I find it somewhat mm -hmm. ironic that it took a counterfeit NFT for the industry to acknowledge the value of original NFTs. 
for sure. I love it. And then uh, last week, of course, uh, well, with Marcus now going over to your side, sa same question. I mean, you specialize in, in lifelike avatars. Uh, again, self-expression can be um, viewed in many ways, and that's one category of what we're seeing. Um, wanted to, what's the POV on your side? Yeah, so I mean, uh, as you said in the beginning, you know, our our vision is actually uh, that uh, that we're working on something where everyone will have his own avatar, you know, his lifelike avatar, because we see the lifelike avatar as as the starting point, you know, if, and it's really about self expression. Um, I mean, in, in in the beginning, you want to be yourself, right, and then you can augment yourself with different stuff, uh, but the starting point is always yourself. And, uh, uh, and so we, we, you know, we're working on this and uh, we've developed uh, our proprietary scanning technology, you know, be it in a retail environment or on a handset, you know, so you can really uh, have that avatar. And uh, obviously if the fashion industry is one of the first uh, uh, industries who's again, you know, first, first mover, you know, besides gaming and everything, we were always ahead, but, but gaming and fashion, you know, that goes very well together. And uh, because our background is actually from gaming and so, so working with uh, digital personalities is something that we've actually grown up with. And uh, so we want to we want to make sure that, you know, uh, with our solution, uh, you know, we're actually targeting the mass market because we want to enable everyone, you know, to find the right size uh, and also to try on clothes before you buy them and and, and help uh, the fashion industry to really solve some of the biggest problems, like pretty much the same as as you do, Elliot, at a, a, a bit of a different way. But we believe, you know, there's uh, there's a lot to do there and uh, and also better customer experience, you know, taking it to the next level. Yeah, it's been one of the um, the thorns in e-com, right, uh, is uh, is trying to get that sizing and that fit right um, and styling right. Uh, so yeah reduces i mean there's a whole waterfall of things but moving on to uh to to megan um so you of course uh mark is coming in from you know lifelike i mean when i go onto red dow's page uh, looking through your portfolio i think my my wrist started hurting after about two minutes of scrolling down and down at all the different collections and of course being agnostic towards lifelike or you know digital uh kind of pixelated looking um, and all kinds of different artworks. I'm, I'm curious to see kind of what's the point of view that you're going to try to bring to this conversation. Well, I just want to say this panel is really incredible. Thank you so much, Claire, for putting together these awesome people because everyone here sort of has pieces that go into play into my main investment thesis. Not so much just Red Dow, but me personally through First Light, I really have focused on redefining ownership and identity all on chain. And a lot of that my thesis is based around photorealism, because if you look at where the users are today, you know, say there's 8 billion people on the planet, 4.7 billion people are using social media. And that's more than people that are using email, online banking, um, using, you know, video games, MMOG gaming. So I think that that is a huge indicator to where we're going to go in the future. And that's, you know, a different version of social media, more like social reality, where we can augment in real time our virtual avatars or digital identities, which we've had for years, right? So since the dawn of the internet, we've had log into your account and we've started to take our identities online through these earlier nascent versions of web browsers and accounts. And now it's just, instead of login, it's connect wallet. And that's really where redefining ownership and identity all goes through this wallet and it's provable. Um, and we get to things like customization, like Ali said, and authenticity and provenance. And for me, it's really exciting around ownership. Um, Pavan, you're wearing one of the artifacts hoodies right now, which has an NFC chip in it. Um, we're actually printing NFC chips right now in the office, but uh, or piece for them. As, as, one, as one does, as one does. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think that uh, in the future, all of our clothing will have some identifier on it that, where we can take post-sale um, consumer data and analytics from the clothing. Like Artifact doesn't know right now that you're on this panel wearing it with us and who's seeing it. But in the future, I think they can. And I think that can all be attributed to the owner through a wallet. So there's a lot around these sort of buzzwords that we that we hear and talk about, um, but new business models more excitingly will come out of it. And that's really where I've been focused. You know, it's it's interesting and go into that then is, you know, when the QR code originally came out, there was no, you know, native reader in iOS, right? 
or any of the, the phone softwares. And once they put it in there, it was like this resurrection of QR on a whole different level. And of course, COVID accelerated those things. I, I really do wish that I could go to a restaurant and expect a physical menu back again. But, you know, those are those are things. But, you know, just to your point, like this, this technology, I what's crazy, what I'm seeing about, you know, you printing out NFC chips over there, or Avery Dennison using RFID and a lot of, you know, RFID tags to, you know, essentially work with supply chain and, you know, maybe NFC chips like Rebecca Minkoff had used in her bags early years ago, right, to gamify the actual usage and, and rewards based of using the bag versus just keeping it in their closet. What what this new technology connecting to essentially the blockchain, whether it's an NFT or otherwise, uh, having your virtual personalities, this is an enabling technology. This allows all of it to actually work together and get really creative on the models. So to start there, um, you know, where where are we now? Because, you know, last year when I was on this, uh, you know, when I moderated a panel for, um, for you know, uh, for Digital Fashion Week New York, one of the panelists uh, was from uh, VGather. And, uh, you know, a lot of us are familiar with these kind of 3D experiential kind of uh, digital platforms, what, you know, during COVID where you would do like a virtual happy hour and you could walk around to the bar room or to the, this room and you could see different things happening. And I feel like that's something that we've kind of come accustomed to is these 3D environments, like whether it's obsessed VR and doing kind of like those virtual showrooming type of things, like, Where's the consumer right now uh, outside of gaming? Like where where is the the comfort level with this all? And and maybe I could I could start if I, if I'm going to point at someone, it's going to point at Blake uh, on on this one. Uh, just because I could only manage uh, imagine that you manage a lot of relationships with a lot of luxury retailers that are testing this stuff out. Of course. So the interesting thing about luxury brands and the way they approach Web three at least in my understanding and in my opinion, is that currently the money for the activations and a lot of those, um, let's say, steps that they take into Web3 still come from marketing budgets. And people often uh, start quoting some numbers. Of course, you mentioned the Dolce Gabbana collection. Of course, that was a huge sale. But ever since then, can say that exactly mm, the entry of luxury brands into fashion was a crazy money maker. But what it does is actually it extends their brand IP into the new platform of communication. And that's currently the key value, securing that dominant position in what they see to be the next way of communicating with the customers. What is, however, ironic is that officially the narrative is that they do it to reach out to younger audiences, uh, Generation Z, Generation Alpha. Mm -hmm. However, it seems that the audience that they bring to Web3 through their strategic moves, their activations, is mostly their core audience, people that were already fans of the brand, not necessarily into crypto and Web3. In many ways, this, this is amazing for the space because it does accelerate adoption. However, um, it seems that the younger generations are still looking for something that's more native to the space rather than a legacy brand entering. Perhaps there is some room for collaboration between those two types of actors in order to really capture the users that you referred to. Well, I guess moving towards then gaming systems, because that truly is where this all stems from, right, is the interactions uh, in gaming and then, you know, weaving through, um, you know, purchase of product, digital product and things like that. That's something that's been already being tested and, and really scaled out quite successfully uh, within gaming platforms. And then also digital fashion has had its moments, right? Where we kind of point to the Travis Scott's things and, and, and things of that nature. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe Marcus, you could touch on this is that, you know, where, like, how do you see the consumer shopping experience online kind of fitting in the next, let's say two to three years? What, what are you building towards? So <clears throat> that's a good question. I mean, um, honestly, uh, you, and you mentioned it uh, before, is like um, what, what we've seen so far um, with, with fashion brands, you know, um, experimenting in the, in the space of, of, of taking their shopping experience into the metaverse, um, some of them uh, do it very simple of just opening up uh, digital stores, you know, where people could wander around. I'm not sure if this is going to be the future, 
I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a different, you know, using the technology as uh, uh, in different ways, you know, of um, like one of the things that that you know, as I said, what we're working on, we're we're together with uh, uh, with H and M, we're building a solution where you can try on your clothes digitally before you buy them, and you can also take them, you know. Of course, we we believe very much in interoperability. Uh, you know, making these the, these uh, garments also available and on, on other platforms. So I think it's going to be uh, um, a lot different than what we see today and, and enhancing the, the shopping experience uh, much more than just, you know, sc scrolling through your app or through your, uh, through your PC and, and uh, trying out things. It's actually going to be more like experience uh, items, uh, really. So, and it'll be you know, once once we get the technical breakthrough, I think it'll all be immersive and uh, much more in VR uh, as we see today. You know, with with AR being a transitional technology, you know, which I think yeah. there's fun stuff you can do with it. But but the real thing is really happening in VR, from my point of view. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, to 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 touch on some of this is like you know the. Like, so AR is a good little gateway drug. It gives you that digital experience. You know, I think in Nabisco on their Oreo box, somebody kind of either they did it independently or they showed just recently where you can scan it and all these different data points around the, the product shows up. And, you know, again, we've been, I think a lot of people are feel good about AR. It's been around for a long time. It's a good kind of ramp mm -hmm. up. But so Ali or, or, or Megan, anyone could jump in on this. Like, what the early like vision or promise of let's say even Decentraland, at least for me, was you know, I'm going to be walking around this metaverse, there's gonna be different cities, um, built up and different areas. So, like, you know, a brand buying you know, a plot next to Snoop Dogg's brand land, like, you found these like land grabs happening very quickly early on. And I did think early on, like, okay, we're gonna be able to like walk through a metaverse and like shop. Or, you know, as we would in Soho, New York or Soho, London or whatever it may be. Um, but because so many of these platforms started building um, and there is no real interoperable platform just yet. And I know there's a lot of folks working on that, um, but there's limitations. Like, where do you see all of this kind of going when it comes to the actual interaction with let's say specifically metaverse and, and platforms that are currently there or new platforms that may arise. I, I'm going to jump into this one, Megan, if that's okay for a second, just because I want to touch on two things. So the first is um, I want to touch on your question. That's a huge accessibility issue, first and foremost. Second, I also want to talk about as a result of that, what I see in the next two to three years, because I don't view the future the same way, quite frankly. Um, so the first big thing I want to touch on is what metaverse means today and what that actually looks like and what technologies we're using to access that. So um, the first thing I would note is that I don't know if it's known by my much of this audience, but uh, Oculus, for example, was very, the lim the testing on Oculus was actually less than 50 women over the course of when they tested the product. Um, and so ma majority of women today actually feel seasick after utilizing uh, a headset, a VR headset for more than five minutes. So when you're looking at a fashion audience already, that significantly decreases the audience that you have access to. So quite frankly, I don't think that we're at enough of a mass adoption of any of these technologies to really say that in the next two years, this is today, right? Things are coming out over the next couple of months that will definitely change that game. And I might bite my tongue in a few minutes. Um, but it's this idea of if that's our future today, that market size is only so big. And in order for many of these fashion brands to survive today and thrive tomorrow with younger audiences, they're going to have to tap into other AR or social media shopping experiences in order to be able to build that brand capital that they're looking for right now. Um, and so one of the things, especially with two to three years out, what I see, and you talked about how there aren't a lot of interoperable experiences out there. One thing I'd like to note is that I feel that everything we've talked about thus far comes very heavily from the business perspective and not from what consumer experiences of today are showing us or what the psychology of consumers is telling us that they want out of these experiences from pure data. Um, so one example of that would be that we know as consumers that your physical self is one of the most trusted 
trusted and last pieces of data that you hold on to and have access to. So when we're talking about disparate experiences across very different universes of AR and VR, to give your name and password, and I think Megan will touch on wallets, I would imagine in a second here, um, is, is not a, a trusted or a safe experience, number one. And number two, if you're only getting clothes from one brand, how much does that do for you? So for example, we're launching with 100 brands on our platform, premium and luxury ready to wear. And also that's all curated just to your body. So your Nord, whatever you would imagine being a Farfetch shopping feed or Net-A-Porter or Nordstrom shopping feed, all of those clothes have been curated. We've been focused on the fit aspect of that. And so I really think that that's where the future is, mostly because we know that social shopping is as big as it is right now. But I only know what an influencer looks like based on the video that they showed me. I don't know their exact measurements. I don't know their fat distribution. So that number, regardless of how much social shopping has grown and also reviews, which we know a lot of which are bot based anyway. So trust over the last year has significantly decreased with consumers in that space. Um, I think that where we're headed is knowing exactly what's going to fit your body when and being able to be the owner of your data and yourself as you travel from experience to experience, whether that's mobily, whether that's AR, whether that's uh, virtual reality in entirety. I think that's the beauty of this is that if we focus on the consumer themselves and what they want and design that customized, personalized experience that consumers are used to in all these other industries out there today, that that's really going to be the mass adoption that we need to be able to grow consumers into these digital data, uh, digital fashion ecosystems, especially younger consumers. And anyone could jump in. I don't need to yeah, continue to have a point on folks, but does anyone um, want to? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add a little bit like Ali's spot on, I think from my, I have the same, share the same sentiment, but I'll continue a little bit on, on that. You know, right now we're living in environments of centralized walled gardens. So our identity, like Ali alluded to, we're putting all of our information in centralized locations and not interoperable. And I think that, um, the mass adopt this innovation curve that we're in will move us over the next 20 years into more of a mass adopted environment. Um, but what comes with that, like when you look at Instagram or Twitter or any of these um, centralized social media platforms or uh, any platform where you're giving your identity, your physical identity information, there's no way to truly verify that you are who you say you are. And even those blue check accounts, we all know you can buy them for 10, 20 grand. It's very easy for people to acquire those accounts and use them as if they've gotten verified for through their um, government issue identity government issued identity. And I think that that's where wallets really will come into play where you can have true ownership of all your, we're all netizens. We're all citizens of the internet. We're operating most of our daily functions through online platforms. And we're going to need to have an environment where we own everything that we do. Um, and I think that comes with easy UI and UX. The adoption is not simple. Um, we have a, a major accessibility issue like Ali also alluded to because uh, how many of you guys have wallets? Does everyone here on the call, do you guys all have crypto wallets? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not actually that easy. And most people, even MetaMask, like the guys over at Consensus think that this is like the best thing ever. And it is great if you started crypto like I did in 2012 and we were using paper wallets, which was super difficult. But now like most of the, of the users oh. that are, are used to using simple, easy one or two step touches. That's not how wallets are today. So we have a we have a big uh, innovation, I think, curve coming soon um, around just the adoption of wallets. Us in uh, ecom, we like to call it. Uh, we need to get to a frictionless experience, and there's yeah. a shit ton of friction right now. Um, but that that's just the nature of anything. Kind of this bleeding edge, right? Is we're, we're running pretty fast. And I do think that the solutions are coming down the pipe, but it's not, it's not there to make someone just easily adopt this technology without even knowing, right, that they're adopting the technology is really going to be the magic to it all. Uh, man, to MetaMask. So we just launched um, a project on Polygon and we wanted to, you know, basically reward people that are coming to our events and, and engage them with, you know, just uh, like an invite to Mint, essentially. And uh, it's a polygon invite or a semi-fungible. You can't even find it. Like nobody knows it's there. So now 
it's uh, so it was built for ethereum you have to switch the whole network resign it it's like the the whole thing even for it's the interoperability of on chain is just not there yet either and i think that that'll come when we see the traditional web 2 platforms or something like it create a very easy back end where the user has no idea that they're even using a wallet I'm hoping Instagram will launch something this year. Their Web3 team is um, very innovative. And, you know, now if you're, I think, I'm not sure how many countries can do it, but I know as a U.S. citizen, you can log into your um, Instagram account, connect a wallet and show your digital collectibles that are in your wallet. Um, and they do have some protections as, um, you know, they don't show your actual wallet address, which is very interesting. Um, but I think that these are just the first steps towards what it'll look like to have uh, wallet as your identity online instead of login account. Well, I mean, you do that, right? Uh, full on your DAO shows the wallet addresses um, versus anyone's pictures, avatars, whatever it may be. Uh, Blake, going back to your uh, comment of, you know, self-expression, uh, you know, there's um, crypto natives uh, and, and Megan, I think you fall into this pile, although I did find you on LinkedIn, barely. Um, is that you, you have kind of a, a walled garden around you a little bit, right? So the the, the whole uh, aspect of being anonymous or an anon, right? And so I'm wondering, like, what are just generally the ethical considerations that go into um, this world where we're creating um, essentially entirely new not just personalities, but beings that that reside in, and represent us in the internet. So I see this question as, as, as twofold. First, I, I, I think Megan made some really great points about the general concept of self-sovereignty, that in the end of the day, even if it's a walled garden, you want to be able to not only own your data, but also monetize the data, not have some third party authority essentially use you to their commercial ends. Um, in many ways, I also believe data going through a wallet is quite an amazing source of analytics and kind of the new, um, something akin to a CRM that you could uh, feed the data into and really find out more about the new face of your customers. And going to the second part of the, of the question. So first of all, it's not clear if I express myself in the metaverse as an alternative virtual personality. Am I still the same personality? I might behave differently. I might identify differently. I might have very different spending habits. So capturing that is interesting, but to talk specifically about maybe ethical concerns, to me, when we talk about virtual personalities, especially with AI growing in authenticity, we're still a long time uh, before like AI can truly pretend to be a human, but I believe it will be a growing field of problems to distinct what is in a way digitally, but human made and what is entirely synthetic generated that will have implications. And then how you attribute the responsibility to let's say a virtual personality that turns out to be steered by AI, but in the wider economic system might take some moves as an economic actor. You might compare it to the ethical issues around algorithms that run the stock exchanges. In the mm -hmm. end of the day, they're just algorithms, but sometimes they take actions that have grave implications for all humans around. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe that was um, kind of a point of friction. Well, to that point, I mean, the early on like stay the first time we saw these like real digital let's say influencers come out right from let's say shodu right that works with the i think it's digital so 2a two a's um you know do your brands or does anyone have any experience with working with you know digital influencers and ai generated uh to that point and and truly how do you is there is there a disclosure that in your all's opinion that needs to happen there um, given that if you're in a metaverse platform, there is no distinguishing factor between a person controlling the helms of the avatar or AI. It's a really interesting concept. I think about this a lot. I see, I have a theory that um, I've noticed a pattern with a lot of my friends that use TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but I have a lot of friends that are, and they all tell me, oh, Megan, it's great. You should get on TikTok because 
uh, you'll have way more followers, way more engagement, way more interaction. And I started recognizing a pattern that everyone I knew told me that they have way more interaction, way more engagement, way more followers on TikTok. And I started doing research and realized probably AI bots, probably not humans. So TikTok is making everyone think they're famous. And I think that we'll eventually live in some internet reality where social reality or social media platforms, everyone will sort of be on some equal playing level and it'll come down to more about data, commerce, um, but there will definitely need to be a, a an identifiable factor around what is human and what is not human and what is the human doing, you know, if you're creating, um, we're at the very, very beginning stages of AI and what we're going to see with AI. So, you know, chat, when chat GPT-4 comes out, I think that's going to change a lot and people are really going to recognize the um power of the blockchain and why we need things on chain and data on chain um, for verifiable identity and proof. So we're still very early in that. That conversation is something that I think a lot about in my head. Um, and there are a lot of really intelligent individuals that are thinking the same thing, but time will only tell because we're also, we're working with these older legacy institutions that don't really see the future and they're not really understanding, you know, the power of these technologies yet and where we're going to go and what will happen. So it's a really mm. awesome time, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. You know, like back going back, this will date me a bit, but um, when I was in college, uh, the only game I really got into in my life was Halo. And there was a network effect. It was like early days of network effect on uh, in that game. And um I remember when there would be a bot, you would you would spot out a bot and the community would essentially turn on and kick out the bot from the gameplay. And I do wonder if that's gonna be how we all look at, you know, AI kind of participation. And maybe it's just dependent on the platform the the reason why you're engaging with that AI or whatever it might be, but you know, it's it's interesting. Any other ethical considerations that folks uh, you you might be thinking about in terms of, of how this gets rolled out? I I definitely do. Um, and so what's really interesting, I'm gonna hold up a really crude drawing for a second. So apologies when I was studying all of the folks who are gonna be on this call and Claire you did a fabulous job because one of the most fascinating things about this group, this is the first time that I've at least gotten to talk with so, with folks from so many different aspects of the industry. And so we're all touching upon this like spectrum of identity. You probably can't see it, but I'll read it to you. So this idea of any given individual's identity is going to fluctuate on a spectrum based on from reality or realism to escapism and where you fall on any given day at any given moment across how you want to express your identity in any given reality has lots of different needs, expectations, um, uh, emotional states to them. And so I'm really excited about all of the ethical implications around mindset work in relation to how all of this is designed. Um, so for example, I know I've read a few of you talk about, and I'm, I'm always very fascinated about what's happening in Asia. So today, an example of that would be if I use my Apple Pay, I have to use Use my face, right? But if I use WeChat Pay in China, I can have an avatar represent my face. So not only is it, is this a bot or is this a person, but now we're talking about, is this a person and where on the spectrum of human do they lie? And how is that uh, definition of human going to change over time too? So today, human to me, mean, today to me means that this is my face, but tomorrow it might mean that I identify more as a cat slash woman. And um, how do people know when I'm being Ally the human or Ally the cat and are they viewed the same way? And then what are the um, implications of how you're treated in virtual environments or physical environments as a result of where you lie on that spectrum? I think is one of the fascinating things about our minds and how we identify with ourselves that I'm most excited about. Do we think WeChat has it right? I look at things generationally. So I think... Um, I'm a millennial. When I look at Gen Z, Alpha, and then Beta, I think that they are going to want to interact more 
like for me, I want more photorealism. I want something that looks like me and something that I can augment and, you know, girls on Instagram use filters and there's all kinds of apps that you can change your hair color and do different things. But I do think that um, the younger generations will want some, because they're growing up with devices in their hands. We didn't, and they are growing up with online identity. We did not really. So I think that they will, the way that they choose to express themselves and their identities will be very, very different. The context will be much different than what we have. And especially the older generations, you know, generations before millennials, a lot of, when I explain crypto or this, you know, metaverse reality that we're exploring and growing and learning and playing in, a lot of them don't get it. And I kind of just tell them it's not really for you, actually. It's kind of for the younger generations and we're building for the future. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it's definitely applicable according to the generation of which you're in. We were talking about earlier today on the one o'clock panel about, you know, what needs to happen for mass adoption. And it did come back to, you know, you know the conversation is always going to lead towards, okay, well, younger generations, 80% of them are identify as gamers. They're already in these environments, right? Like this is how they are already in condition to, uh, interact. Um, is that what we're doing? Is, are we really truly just building? Um, are we ushering in uh, hopefully a responsible way to roll out for the next generation and see how brands then participate later? Or are we here today? Um, and what are we seeing if at all with like true like brand to let's say avatar relationship right now beyond gaming? So I I, I, anybody else want to go? I've talked a lot, so I'll let somebody else speak. Okay. Happy to, happy. okay oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, please. Um, no, I just wanted to jump in and maybe talk about one main challenge that I see for adoption. And actually, at the root of its challenge, it's not technological. Recently on the A16Z podcast, Neil Stevenson, the author of the book Snow Crash, was talking about his definition of the original metaverse from the book and how it's different from what we're seeing right now and what it means for metaverse adoption. And I think he quoted the first rule of the metaverse that there is the metaverse. There isn't many metaverses, oh, which yeah, doesn't yeah. mean that there's one dominant that wins that is owned by Meta or any other company. It means that all of those virtual spaces are kind of interoperable and asset can, assets can travel f freely in that open system. The problem right now is that there is no incentive structure in place for all of those virtual environments to open up their gates and to start kind of building that true interoperability where all those avatars can freely travel throughout different contexts, different virtual worlds in the frame of what we call the wider open metaverse. Do we, and until we get wider... that, it's, it's hard to think about like real adoption and the value I... proposition of the metaverse. Look, there, there's a bunch of, it will happen, right? I mean, that interoperability is is critical to any of this, I, I believe, at least moving forward properly. Um, but with that said, then we're gonna, what sounds based on what Ali was saying is that we're gonna have a huge spectrum of identity uh, mingling with each other. And that, that could be a really cool vision of the future where you have a very hyper-realistic uh, Povin showing up to Alley Cat and, and we're going out on a shopping date or, you know, or we're going to go watch a, a live podcast recording somewhere. I don't know. Right. Is that, is that what we're like, who, who, who's got, um, I guess, a vision of what that looks like. Is that what we're like, who's building towards uh, kind of that sort of vision? So I can speak to that because the fa fashion industry obviously was not where I started my career and it's definitely not the end for Etta. Um, so fashion is actually just the beginning of this digital self that we've created, your, your light body, we call it. Um, and so what's really fascinating is, and that doesn't, that plugs into lots of different avatars. So Nexar would be a great example of a digital avatar that would plug in on top of the data layer that is your digital self. Um, but for us, we have viewed the power, I'm just going to give an example of where 
we're going to give one use case of where things are headed, I think. Um, but I came from the healthcare space, right? Health tech space predominantly and security, cybersecurity. So I have, I have already seen how digital twins are in play in a lot of realms, but the adoption of digital twin technology is really scary to a lot of individuals as we get younger or as the generations get younger, that changes a little bit. But I think fashion is one of the, the uh, safest, most um, palatable use cases to move into the digital ecosystem and digital business models. So for us, it's really how do we build the world's largest repository of human body shape data that can be utilized, uh, anonymized body shape data that can be utilized in a number of other ways. Um, so for example, every time I go speak, I get approached constantly by healthcare companies who are interested in how body shapes are changing over time and how that could better predict how, mm -hmm. for example, we uh, you can better predict how some if somebody's going to get diabetes or if they're um, if you're trying to have fitness goals as a component of this fitness and wellness. There's all these other implications that I think are going to plug into fashion, and those that are able to build the most trusted relationships right now will be those who have the opportunity to explore this spectrum of identities and playing in all these spaces. Because if you can't get the trust of a consumer and keep that trust, maintain it over time, it doesn't really matter what innovations you build next. If people don't want to give you their data, that's kind of the end of the road for you, I believe. Trust is uh, just getting fractured every, every quarter. There seems to be something that fractures the trust of the, the consumer. So although we inherently know the, the data the safety around data uh, and how we're building it is robust and more robust than the payment solutions and, and the systems in place today. Um, that's gonna be a really tough one to continuously get and beat down a peg nonstop. Um, I, you know, we haven't heard from Marcus in a while. I'm, I'm curious about this one thing. I, 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 I feel now what I'm getting from my conversations is like, until like a tipping point won't happen until technology or experience as well as kind of like the um, the younger generations age up a little bit, like mm -hmm. there's going to be that kind of cross section, and then we're going to have this explosion of uh, of consumer adoption and this interactivity between brand and uh, these new platforms. Does that mean like brands? I mean, the reality is, if your profile is an elder customer, or if you're a luxury brand and just from a capacity, a financial capacity, you're, you're targeting an older customer, are you left behind if you're not aging down in your storyline, in your marketing, in, um, and in your product assortments, your digital, like rolling out digital uh, products and, and things of that nature to capture the imagination of young people now? The best time to sell a, a luxury car, right, is when a child is six years old. <laughs> That's right. No, I mean, uh, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see, especially a lot of the, as you said, the luxury brands who are trying a lot uh, out in, in games like, you know, Gucci or I, I don't know, was Gucci on uh, on uh, on Minecraft and all that stuff where, you know, you think from the outside or like Ralph Lauren and, and Fortnite's like, why do these guys do this? Because, you know, it, it, at first sight, it looks like totally crazy and a waste of money because these these people won't won't be able to afford the uh, these these brands but in the end as you say they grow up you know so it's like a very early investment into uh, brand identity there and uh, if it's going to work out in the end you know uh, they're going to have to see that but i think that's that's why they do it and then eventually it might uh, might become successful you know and uh, so so in this case it's um, but it really also comes around in terms of because we were speaking about ethics uh, ethics before you know is it is it really is it is it good you know is it a good thing that these luxury brands uh, you know start going into those more childish uh, areas uh, in the very early stage you know and building up these this brand awareness and and people wanting and aspiring for brands you know is this the right thing you know that's that I think that's a very interesting question ethical question as well because you know is this the most important thing to aspire another large luxury brand, even if you're like six to 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 twelve or something. So maybe that's not 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 a good move, you know. Also, when when speaking about you know thinking about from a, from, from an ethical way, you know, we uh, we of course kind of came at a crossroads with the IP um, situation between uh, Hermes and and Meta Birkin, but you know it gets me thinking about 
you know, especially with Twitter handles and you could kind of almost impersonate or take the name of somebody else. An avatar, I could build an avatar that looks like Ali, Megan, uh, that looks like Marcus or Blake. And what are the considerations there that I'm running around town and 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 representing uh, somebody else, not not a different version or an identity of my self expression, but mm-hmm. truly somebody else. Yeah, you yeah. can do that today. You can do that now on AI platforms. You can do voice recognizer, recreate somebody's voice, create a deep fake that is so real. And I think that that is another reason why people are going to want and definitely need on-chain identity verification. Mm, Yeah, that's the key. I totally agree. I totally agree because uh, you know, especially when you're the more uh, realistic your avatar becomes, you know, in terms of interacting. I mean, is it like you know, is it really Marcus speaking, you know, or is it a colleague, is someone in a motion capture suit, uh, you know, moving with my avatar? Um, I mean, so that that really is is very important, and you know, combining that with NFT or other blockchain technology to you know to get the verification, um, and that this really a true the person you know who's behind that avatar is really that that same person. I think that really is is a very important thing to happen. Now, now, what about the instance? I mean, of course, in my MetaMask, I have three wallets, but I could create a wallet in an instant, right? I mean, the software wallets are, are simple. To, to create, you press a button, you get a new software wallet. Um, it's infinite. So w- what about that? What about uh, me representing, because uh, again, right now, at least in my own activity is, you know, I'll, I'll use one wallet to store things, another wallet to purchase things, another wallet, you know, like, so just taking that to the avatar side, then how does that prevent anything if it's just necessarily on chain? I think something we haven't touched on on this call is a lot of our devices right now are external on our box. Some people use wearables. Um, we are moving into a reality where I think in the next 10 or 15 years, any of the world's population will be chips. Um, not Neuralink. I think Neuralink I, 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 have a, I have an NFC chip in my hand. <laughs> yeah, in your, in your hand with your wallet, right? Yeah, so I have, I mean, and I got this years ago through a company, I think it was Digiwell at a conference out in, of course, San Francisco. They they sit there piercing people with NFC chips and SF. So, um, yeah. you know, that's, I, yeah, here Very we are. Cool. <laughs> well, there, there's um, one of our portfolio companies is um, Synchron, and they have these stenoids, which is uh, about half the size of your pinky. And it, the stenoid actually goes into an artery and it can interop. There's six humans right now on the planet that can interop have an interoperability um, just through their brain directly IOTing into different devices. Neil, Neil Harbison I, being one of them, right, Neil? Sorry? Is Neil Harbison one of them? Uh, the gentleman that had an implant, like an antenna implant in his... I think like that a, that's BlackRock Neurotech. That's a okay. different company. So that's the brain. This is just a stenoid that goes into an artery, um, which is, I, I don't think that the actual brain chips will be scalable because we're not going to get, we're not going to be lining up to have surgery to take a piece of our skull out to put a chip in that actually creates inflammation in the brain. So <laughs> I don't think that's going to be scalable. But these feel, um, little stitches go in. Sorry? That Advil won't help that inflammation? Yeah, no, not long term. Um, but I do think that, you know, with the advent of these little stenoids and people that are functioning with them today and using them, um, many of us will opt for the chip inside of us instead of dealing with things outside of us. And when that happens, then we really are tying our physical human identity to an online identity. And I think that that really will be the differentiator. And of course, you're going to have many, many, many wallets. And some of them, you may not want to publicly attribute to your public identity or the identity that people see. Um, And I think that that's where we'll get a balance of really what is transparent and what are you sharing online? And then what is private and secure that you don't have to share? And I think that we'll have solutions on chain for that in the next 10 or 15 years as we see these products rolling out. Unreal. Is that the future you're building towards? Or you're investing towards? I think, yeah, investing. I think that it's inevitable. Um, Many people get really scared and fearful with any, you know, invent. Yeah, no, people don't want to get a COVID shot. 
technology that's unfamiliar. People get scared and fearful, but I think that, I think it's inevitable. And I think that knowing that um, people that want to build for the empowerment of humanity and for uh, deep, true, real decentralization and privacy can do so now um, and, and contribute to the minds of the people that are building the hardware instead of allowing the old way and the old paradigm of, you know, centralized walled gardens owning our data and information. And we really don't have control over that. So um, I'm excited about it because I see that there's a big opportunity for a new wave. And we're sort of leaving the old wave and going into this new reality um, where we'll use hardware in a different way. Yeah, I mean, if we are connected to the blockchain as beings, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can now that opens up my my whole thought thread on the security um, advances that can lead to. Um, it would require a completely decentralized financial system, I would assume, and but that's what I get. I think we're all kind of headed towards, or uh, anyhow, uh, based on the nods. I would have Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I, I'm not a maximalist, but you know, their crypto generally and DeFi is is just a matter of time. I think in the circles that that we're all speaking in, so it's wild. It's a wild uh, future. Um, uh, just the advancement itself, and I'll leave with this because Claire's coming on with the uh, with the final punctuation. But, you know, a friend of mine uh, worked at NASA and, uh, you know, just having, you know, he worked on, I forget the, the name of the project that studied Saturn's rings, but either way, not relevant to this, the question I asked him, which was more about like, you know, what's your take on extraterrestrials? Obviously, when we're drinking at a beer garden uh, in the middle of Bushwick, that's what you're going to ask somebody that works at NASA. And, you know, the, uh, the response was, that, well, it's ridiculous to think that there's no other form of life. Um, we generally as a community feel that we are just not evolved enough to communicate. Um, it's as if uh, other, other beings that may be more evolved um, are just kind of uninterested as we're uninterested in talking to ants. So uh, it's, it's funny because that just sparked your conversation. You just let that thought, that's what came up in my head is that uh, evolution is essentially going to be accelerated through technology. Um, whether it's the vision that you're laying out um, or, or, uh, or an alternate, uh, we surely see the rumblings of it happening fast now. So pretty crazy. Claire. Wow, thank you. What an intense conversation. Um, as the uh, somebody in a previous discussion said, the train has already started. So you just have to, to get on board or you're going to be left behind. But this was, I mean, this was such a wonderful conversation. When you put five brilliant minds in a virtual room together, you're going to have such an incredible conversation. I love the argument for the um, on-chain technology. And I really like how you all framed it and addressed the ethics of it as well. Um, and raised the topic of really the spectrum of our humanity as well. My personal feeling is that technology should really facilitate the human connections and our interactions with with life and, and the world around us. So it was very, very interesting to hear all your perspectives. I'm so grateful for having so many brilliant people here. Thank you so much for sharing your, your opinions and your expertise. And um, I look forward to seeing a lot of you at some events coming up pretty soon. So thank you so much. Cheers, Claire, thank you. And, and everyone else also, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I look forward to keeping in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.